That's what's recording right now. Good. All right. So it's rolling. Oh, we got Eric Three coming seconds. in right now. <laughs> hey, you go. That's that. Grab a document. So I apologize, guys. I'm not much of a tech guy either. But I have to tell you, I don't have a whole lot of time. Um, we, we run these things pretty quick. This is not the first time I've gotten an opportunity to do it. I'm honored and privileged to be asked. But over the course of the last um, probably year and a half, I've gotten personally serious about uh, this very same topic. So I just had this conversation this morning and last night with fellow nurses that I work with about morale and how impossible it is to improve morale without improving your self-care. Okay, so typically what we do in healthcare is we focus way downstream about the patient interaction. Better IV tubing, better process improvement, better communication skills. If I'm up here telling you about how to take care of a patient, but your back really hurts because you haven't taken care of it, or you are stressed to the gills because you don't know how to manage your life, or uh, your cholesterol is through the roof, or you really want to quit smoking, or you haven't slept for two days, does anything I'm saying about IV tubing matter? But we do that all the time, don't we? We as an organization or in healthcare really take care of patients and we talk about patients, but upstream of that, we're not talking about self-care. So I want to talk about morale in relation to taking care of yourself. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hands, but I guarantee you most of you in here are sleep deprived. Most of you in here are stressed right now. So this conversation that I'm videotaping right now is for posterity because I'm going to put it on YouTube if you guys are okay with that. I'm not going to catch many of you on video. If I do, it'll just be the back of your heads. I'm going to put it on YouTube because even just my 20 minute old segment because this is the conversation I keep trying to have corporately person to person. When I go and try and walk or do some exercise at work, I usually go alone. When I bring out my carrots and my celery and my cottage cheese for, for dinner, I usually get heckled. And I have to start the conversation over again from ground zero about how you've got to fight the urge to, my job is so stressful. I don't get up and pee. <laughs> how many times do you guys hear that? We don't even have time to pee. <laughs> How's that working for you? How about pyelonephritis? Right? How about some ureter infection? How long is that going to work before eventually you are suffering from something we're going to call compassion fatigue? How many of you guys have heard of compassion fatigue? Everyone raise their hands. Okay. Compassion fatigue. I believe in order to answer the problem about high morale, really all you need is a good defense against compassion fatigue. If you can stave off compassion fatigue, you guys are already motivated. You know what we said? What motivates you? Money. <laughs> coffee. Food. <laughs> then go be an accountant. <laughs> go be a lawyer or a stockbroker. This class is full. And if you guys don't know it, you are in a losing battle. You signed up for this career because your heart is in the right place. I couldn't talk you out of it if I had to. So you're being funny saying motivated by food. I know you. I don't know you, but I know you. You're here for the right reasons. And I can't dissuade you. If I could, I would. Because it's nasty. The opportunity to, I mean, sometimes I think about showing my family what I do for a living, and then I think, nah. <laughs> I don't really want them to know. I want them to think, daddy's a nurse. <laughs> and he's all clean. Every day, he just nurses. <laughs> and I think sometimes if people really knew what we did, and it's not day after day, after day it's month after month after year after year, how are you going to stake this up? So this is a great quote from Mother Teresa. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. 
For you see, in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Mother Teresa. Anybody understand that quote? Anybody ever shook hands with Mother Teresa? Do you feel closer to her now? Do you get what I'm saying? I couldn't talk you out of it if I had to. I'm going to do this anyway. You're yelling at me, calling me all kinds of names, and you've thrown human waste at me. <laughs> I'm not doing it for you. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about the patient. It's really about pouring yourself out. How long can you do that before eventually I don't pee? I don't take breaks. And when I come to work, it's a stressful situation. Let me line something out for you. How many hours a day should you sleep? Six to eight, right? How many hours a day do we typically work in a work week? Eight hours. How many hours a day, a day do you get to yourself? Eight, right? So you got eight hours to do everything you got to do. You got eight hours to eat right and exercise. Yeah, right. Okay, so just imagine dividing your day, a 24-hour day, 8, 16, 24. All of a sudden now, that eight hours that was yours, well, the eight hours at work, that's just got to be stressful. That's got, that can't be the place where I take care of myself. Oh, and the, the, the time that I sleep, i got to sleep, right? And so the eight hours that are to myself are divided between school and my family, my kids, my wife, my husband, my parents, my community, opportunities like this, all of a sudden, okay, I get about maybe a fifth of my third. You see what I'm saying? And all my healthy attitudes and behaviors have to sit on this toothpick of a whirlwind of a cucumber, of a, of a watermelon, right? So I've got a watermelon of work and sleep and stress and dysfunction, and it's got to be supported by this tiny little toothbrush that's called my own personal self-care. Is that ever going to work? If I'm trying to support the two-thirds with one-third, it's not going to work. If I'm trying to support two-thirds with a fifth of a third, that's even crazier. I'm no mathematician, but you've got to have healthy behaviors and self-care permeate over into the work life. Am I right? Am I right? Yes. Listen to me, nurses. This will happen. When you get to work, people are going to say, I don't know what you do for a living, but I'm too busy to go take a 10-minute walk. I don't know what you do for a living, but I don't pee. I don't know what you do, but my patients come first. And I'm having this conversation with you. Because I'm tired of it. Because it's driving nurses into the ground. And they quit. And they're good nurses. What tends to happen is we get so centered on, I can't take a break. I can't take care of myself. I will do that after my shift. I'll do that after my three shifts in a row. Oh, but I'm so spent. The next day after my three shifts in a row, I got nothing to do anyway. So now there's only seven days in a week. And all of a sudden, four or five are dedicated to amping up or calming down. Now I'm down to two days a week. You see what I'm saying? And if I go to a party, all right, and there's cupcakes, I'm going to eat all of them because I'm so stressed out. <laughs> and my mindset isn't set up for that. So we push this, and I believe in this, don't get me wrong. Nobody can talk me out of the career choice I've made. I worked hard just like you guys. This is my ideal. But I cannot do this consistently if I don't take care of myself. Would you agree? Yeah. Now listen, I need to hear it vociferously. Do you agree? Yes! Vivaciously yes. agree. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, yes, I agree. Yes, yes I agree. <laughs> All right. So this, uh, I can't believe this is all working. This is amazing. <laughs> this was actually, oh, it's not going to work. Okay. Oh, 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 I had an opportunity uh, on the cancer floor. Oh, Have you guys seen this? Yeah. So, Okay, so you guys saw it already? No, no they haven't. No. Everybody has it. 
<laughs> and I didn't think about that. But if we get focused on that IV more than we get focused on that human being, we've missed it, haven't we? And we get paid to chart. Make no mistake. You will not, I mean, if you love people, and you do, you won't get fired for loving on people. You'll get fired for not charting uh, a chest tube. That's a shame. I can't fix that for you. You got to figure that out in your home. All I can change, all I can inspire, all I can promote is you taking care of you. I don't, I don't want to talk about self-governance and leadership in your organization. I want to talk about you having an honest conversation in the mirror when you leave looking for these moments. All right. Whew, can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> All right. I have no idea how to make this work now. Stand by. So that's one end of the continuum. Here's another end of the continuum. You guys are going to be blown away by this. This is unreal. It's Friday morning, which is when we hear from StoryCorps, celebrating the lives of everyday people. And here's our story. Today, Maurice Roland and Miguel Alvarez, they work at Edward Valley Spring Center, which is an assisted living home in California. Or rather, it was. Maurice was a cook, Miguel a janitor. And last fall, the company that managed the home abruptly shut it down, leaving many of the elderly residents with nowhere to go. The staff stopped being paid, and they all left except for Maurice and McGill. At StoryCorps, they talked about three days in which they cared for abandoned residents alone. Here's Maurice. There was about 16 residents left behind, and when we had a conversation in the kitchen, what were we going to do? If we left, they would have nobody. We were just the cook and the janitor, but I was cleaning people up, helping take a bath. I was passing out meds. My original position was the cook, but we had like people that had dementia. I just couldn't see myself going home. Next thing you know, they're in the kitchen trying to cook their own food and burn the place down. You know what I mean? I was only going for one hour, take a shower, get dressed. Didn't be there for 24 hour days. There are people up three in the morning walking around and... Yeah, you couldn't go to sleep. I'll bring movies from my house. Let's watch this at three, four in the morning. Been there, go to sleep. Even though they wasn't on our family, they were kind of like our family for a short period of time. You know, you feel sad, but you don't want to show them you feel like that, you know? My parents, when they were young, they left me abandoned. And knowing how they going to feel, I didn't want them to go through that. I think you're pretty strong for sticking in there. You too, Maria. If I would have left, I think that would have been on my conscience for a very long time. Maurice Roland with Miguel Alvarez of StoryCorps in Hayward, California. They cared for elderly residents of Valley Springs Manor until the fire department and the sheriff could come to take over. The incident led to the legislation in California known as the Residential Care for the Elderly Reform Act of 2014, which protects residents from being abandoned after a shutdown. This conversation is archived by the Library of Congress, and you can get the StoryCorps podcast on iTunes as well as at npr.org. Did you guys catch what just happened? Did you guys see that? Can you can you imagine that? Can you can you for a second imagine getting in your car and leaving 16 residents, and they're standing at the window like, see ya, I, they're demented. The cook and the janitor took over. How, does it, how do you get there? I'll tell you how you get there. I don't pee! This place owes me! I am neglect. You don't have an idea of what I do here. Nobody appreciates me. You let that fester long enough and forget those patients! I work with people. You will work with people. And they will not have that behind their eyes. And it's not their fault. I don't believe it's their fault. 
They have bought into a system that has told them, you don't blink. You don't turn away. You sit right there. You stand right there at the bedside. You neglect yourself until you burn out. And then you keep coming after you've burnt out. And that is the other end of the spectrum. So we've got a spectrum over here. I need to take care of my patients, but I really am here to love on people. And this end of the spectrum that says, it's not my problem. I quit. I quit years ago. I just show up. If I hear another person say, it is what it is, I'm going to knock them in the head. <laughs> I hate that phrase. <laughs> it is what it is means I, I can't change it. How about it is what you make it? This system is only as good as the people in it. And until we start to push back and say, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. My stethoscope is not a doctor's stethoscope. My costume is not a costume. It is an outfit that is made for work. Does that make sense? We are neglected and looked over because we go, hey, I just work here. I just get a job. I just, I'm motivated by food and money. That's not real. That's not true. And the people that tell me that when they get to work, they were just like you 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I asked a new grad last night if she would come today. She said, this is not a good time. I've had three really hard shifts. I won't be joining you. They don't want to talk to me about morale. How about we go do a 7 minute workout? I said, no. I'm just... And she sat right there at her computer, feeling stressed, feeling busy, but allowing the walls to cave in around her. Does that make sense? Do you know what I'm saying? Boy, I hope that video tape's rolling. What is morale? The dictionary meaning is mood and spirit. High morale means an enthusiastic, confident feeling with respect to individual or group achievement. And employment morale means refers to the participative attitudes toward achievement of organizational objectives. It means team spirit and togetherness of people for a common purpose. How many of you see that every day on the floors when you do clinicals? <coughs> okay, everybody! <laughs> Let's huddle up! You try that on a floor. Try that on a <laughs> you say... Can we just, can we hold hands? I'm into it for the organizational objectives. Ha! Huh. Let's say it together, everybody. The mission, vision, and values. You will get Jack's lap. Nobody there believes in this. Right? They're, they're not necessarily booing it. But this I saw something the other day on uh, Facebook. It compared a new grad nurse with an experienced nurse. Have you seen that? New grad nurse thinks you can't chart enough. You know, experienced nurse says, you know, don't chart it or it'll be a problem. New grad nurse answers the phone on the first ring. Experienced nurse looks at the caller ID. <laughs> I mean, it was like 30 of those. And it was brutal. It was brutal. Because I thought, what's happened? That that's funny. It's true. But it shouldn't be funny. It shouldn't be true. <laughs> Compassion fatigue. Sometimes thought of as a special form of burnout. Compassion fatigue affects people in the caring professions. Doctors, nurses, counselors, ministers. Compassion fatigue results from caring to the point that you are drained of empathy. <coughs> I just work here. It is what it is. I can't change it. And you're talking about the system. You're talking about the charting. You're talking about reimbursement. You're talking about how we hurry patients through, or we don't. Some people, I'm language, I just don't have enough time to take care of a patient. Well, you had that same patient for a week. I know, they're driving me crazy. You see what I'm saying? It's one end of the spectrum or the other. The system isn't the problem. How do we control the pieces of the cogs inside the wheel? That's us. That's us. This is a great article, and in fact, I'm going to send it to you, Ashley, and I'll make sure that Ashley gets a copy. This is a PDF from a group uh, on compassion fatigue 
I love this quote. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. If you're not affected, something's wrong. But how do we counteract that? Self-care. Healthcare workers need self-care. And no organization in the world, there will be a lot of them that come up and say, did you clean your hands? I just saw you come out of the room and I didn't see you clean your hands. I would love an organization that said, are you really stressed? You look really stressed. Can I give you like a half hour break? Do you just want to go like lay down in the in the doctor's lounge just for a little bit and just close your eyes? You know, would you like would, would you like a, a fruit smoothie? We've got them made in the break room. You really look like you could use a break. Never happened to me. Ever, ever, ever. A lot of people busted me on my hands. Why do they care about the rest of me? Because it's not reimbursing. So I'm a cynic, but I'm an optimistic cynic. <laughs> I'm a naive optimistic cynic in that I think me talking to you can change things. I'm naive in that way. I'm just naive enough to get up here and talk past my time. I'm really sorry. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this great article and this next page says the personal improved self-care is the cornerstone of compassion fatigue prevention. I don't want to talk about high morale because what I can't do is get everybody in the huddle before morning shift or before we get to going at, at night and say, guys, just be happy. Let's just be, have high morale. Okay, but you don't understand. I, no, I don't want to hear the problems. I just want you to be happy. Okay, but I can. That's it. Is that what the, this is what you're doing? This is what I want you to do. Don't tell me the problem. I just need you to have high morale. No, no. You have got to prevent compassion fatigue in order to have high morale. Organizations would do well to learn about those prevention strategies, wouldn't they? Anybody heard about a nursing shortage? <laughs> this is great. It talks about eating right, exercising, and getting plenty of sleep. How about a massage every once in a while? <laughs> right? I could use one right now! But if I can't have a massage, that's what I did last night. My patient I went by and I said, hey guys, how about we do a seven minute workout? Guess, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's what I normally get. <laughs> I said, how about we do a 30 second workout? Guess, uh... Well, hold on a second. You mean like squats and stuff? No, no. How about we just reach up toward the sky? You stay in your seat. 30 seconds. And, and everybody did it. They're, they're, they're not really charting. <laughs> And so for 30 seconds we went like this. And then one of them started going, oh my, oh my God. That feels that feels great. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven. Okay, we're done. See you guys. <laughs> if you're not willing to do a seven-minute workout, if you don't want to do it, just say I don't want to do it. But I can't, I can't hire a masseuse to show up at three in the morning, but I can stretch. Why don't we do that? Why? Do we have an immediate repulsion to that? We do. Because we feel like it distracts me from my real purpose. Let me tell you something. Lack of self-care is a patient safety issue. Now all of a sudden you got people's attention when you say it's a patient safety issue. That's like scanning the medication before you give it. That's like calling the name and birth date. That's like cleaning your hands patient safety issue. I might get somewhere with that. All right. You've got to take care of yourself. Here's a great way to do it. How many times people tell you diet and exercise? How many of you guys have seen this? This book. Great book. I'm doing it with my family starting the 21st. Yes, it goes all the way to the October 31st. <laughs> so Halloween, they get no candy. <gasps> but they can store it and we'll divulge it November 1st, right? <laughs> but we're going to document it. I'm going to videotape my 15-year-old daughter, my 8-year-old son, my 12-year-old boy. And I'm really looking forward to that. I encourage you to write this down. This is good science. 
10 days, your tongue completely rejuvenates or replenishes uh, the taste buds. So normal high fructose corn syrup doesn't taste right anymore. But a pineapple tastes unreal, <laughs> right? Because you, you get back to what's good. So I've encouraged people, let's do a 10 day no sugar diet. Let's do a 10 day no sugar challenge. No added sugar. You can have all the carrots and bananas and pineapple you want. You, can't have, you can have milk, you can't have chocolate milk. Does that make sense? If it's got added sugar, you don't eat it. Right, Cody? Yeah. Corey? Cody? Yeah. 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 Mr. Yeah. R? Big yeah. R? <laughs> tell him, you want to tell him? Oh, I've been doing it for like 15 days. I'm what? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, like fruit does taste really good. I've lost like 13 pounds so far. And. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, the like food tastes amazing. So you, you don't eat as much because like I love pizza and I can eat pizza all day. Like, but you don't eat as much. But what you do eat is pretty dang good. So <laughs> carrots are even really sweet. <laughs> is that nuts? Yeah. So. so what happens is you quit eating sugar and you're you're not compelled to eat beyond what you can eat. Does that make sense? Read the book. <laughs> Just read it. We talk about diet and exercise. This is what I cling clung on to. There's a million other methods. I'm just a proponent of this one because it was simple. It was a tiny habit that I could manipulate. I could do one thing for 10 days. No added sugar for 10 days? I got that. I thought I was going to die. Because <laughs> I was a diet coke addict. Two king size Snickers in a ship. So I put this in our paper at Billings Clinic in June of last year. Wanted 15 to 20 people to go no sugar, 10 days. What do you say? 75 people email me. We've been doing it every three months since then. Over 400 people have done this program now with me. It's on your honor. And some people, day three, are like, forget that. That's stupid. I knew that. What about my coffee creamer? Oh, I had a barbecue. Oh, my son forced me. You know what I mean? It was out of my control. You can be an agent of change, is my point. How many times do people come to work in, in the break room? Oh, oh no. I, I'm that guy. I take pictures of the break room now. People hide their stuff. Oh, he's coming. He's coming. Oh. Because <laughs> we sabotage ourselves. I just came back from the Montana Nurses Association convention. Boom! As soon as you walk in, big table, five boxes of donuts. Five boxes. Now, if I'm stressed and I'm at work and I gotta grab something to go and I'm really needing a pick me up, I might be able to justify a donut. We are all off work. Why is this still here? Right? Because you like it that way, right? That's the way you like it. And we are going to sabotage ourselves right into disease if we're not careful. How many of you want to be a patient? How many of you want to be laying in the bed going, oh, 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 oh did you clean the port? Oh. <laughs> oh, but excuse me, I'm whacked out on morphine. I got nothing. <laughs> and maybe they're cleaning the port. Maybe they're not. How many of you want to take care of a nursing instructor? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nobody wants to be the patient. Then why are we going 90 miles an hour toward this cliff? You watch what I'm telling you. When you get on the floor... Self-care is nowhere on the radar. Nowhere on the radar. So, there's an app. This, that's the diet part, was the, the no, no added sugar. There's an app called the 7-Minute Workout. I mean, you've heard of it. Couple hands. Good, good. Johnson & Johnson. Go ahead. Write it down. I know you want to. Johnson & Johnson 7-Minute Workout. This is the official 7-Minute Workout. What they realized was... 30 minutes in the morning, and then you sit the rest of the day? How many people do I work with? And they say, oh, I got my 14 steps to the patient's room, and then I took me 14 steps back to the nurse's station, and then I charted for 14 minutes. And then I took another 14 steps to the next call light, and that's not your workout! <laughs> I had somebody tell me last night, turning that 300-pound patient is my workout. I said, no, it's not. That is not a workout, because you don't do it like this. Okay! Okay, okay, and two more. Oh boy, I'm ready to sweat now. How about you? You get nauseous? Hold on. We got you cleaned up six minutes ago, girl. Just shut up. Hold on. That's a workout. Saying that your job is your workout. You know, they're doing uh, the, the, the World Series now. 
Saying that that's your job is like the pinch hitter coming in. He hits a home run and he goes, that's my workout. I trot around the three bases, I hit home, I'm done. Him hitting a home run is the culmination of all the hard work he's done. He had to go lift and run and diet and try out and be good for the team and stay sober so that he could hit that home run. <laughs> you turning the patient is the home run of the culmination of the hard work and exercise that you've done to make sure your back doesn't get wretched when you do that because you've got good, strong core muscles. Do you see what I'm saying? To say that my job is my workout is a fallacy. Do not fall into that habit. Your job, your, your lifestyle allows you to have a good job. Oh! <laughs> Tired of it. Look at this. This is on... Inpatient surgery. If you guys, if we're not friends on Facebook, you gotta friend me up here. At Billings Clinic, and we are in the hallway. I walked in on this. They were already doing it. I didn't do it. And Kayla's getting her first one now, and these other. This is at the. This is 7:30 at night. And they have already worked a day shift, so they're getting it before they go home, right? What's wrong with that? Do we need a gym? If we don't have a culture, we can't build a gym. Until we have people pushing for this kind of stuff, we'll never get them. And not letting things get in your way. So these guys just clocked out after a hard 12-hour shift. These nurses are awesome. They're inspirational. They're doing the seven-minute workout from Johnson Johnson, the free It's free, guys. It's free. <laughs> I have dozens of these. Dozens of these. You want to know the you want to know the pushback that I get in the comment section? I usually delete them. I take a bunch of stuff for putting. Oh, it must be nice where you work. Wow, I wish I had time to pee. I don't even have time to pee. I, if I hear that one more, <laughs> you're playing Candy Crush. You probably got time to pee. <laughs> Candy Crush, yeah. Saga. <laughs> Here's the deal. This is what changed me, and this can change you. I want you to write down tinyhabits.com. The idea is if you're motivated and you have the ability, then you can change behavior. Behavior equals motivation times ability times a trigger. Every morning at 1, 3, and 5 in the morning, I do a 7-minute workout. If I can't, if I can't make it at 1, I do it at 1.30 or at 2, or I adapt, right? But I've got a trigger in my head saying get three 20 minute, 20, three 7-minute exercises at least because now I'm exhausted. I want to go home. I'm not going to go run 3 miles. I'm not going to go lift weights. I got nothing. I gave it to my patients. That's how it should be. But i got to build up a bank of stuff to give to my patients or I'm trying to pour tea from an empty cup. This is really what happened to me. I started doing small behaviors over a period of time consistently and it led to great results. I have a story. A year and a half ago I weighed 50 more pounds. But my mom died at 60 of a massive coronary. And I thought, I shouldn't die early because of my career choice. No one deserves to die early because of their career choice. I don't care if you're a coal miner or a night shift worker in a hospital. That is not fair. And it got real for this guy up here. It got real. Yes, I did not do this per se because I knew about it. I did this and look back and it was a retrospective. All of a sudden I realized tiny habits over time are what changed me. Okay. Ah! And good management. Oh yeah. These guys support the heck out of me. Every tough email I get from corporate, hey you can't post pictures like that. Yeah, see I can actually. These guys got my back.
That's me. Got <laughs> some big old thighs. <laughs> this is Sandy and Christy, nursing resources at Billings Clinic. So yes, it is. To find a really good department to work for and a couple C Nations in this class know how awesome ooh, they are ooh. to have as bosses. This is who you want to work for. That's absolutely right. So are you guys ready to do the seven minute workout? Yeah. <laughs> Can we do it? Yes. Can we do it? Are you guys ready? Stand up right where you're at right now. Ready? Oh my god. <laughs>
compassion fatigue, and you'll be all right. Thanks, guys, for your time.